Hello everyone and welcome to the Media Club at the Media Education Lab. And today we have a very, very special session uh, where editors, Professor Pierre Fasse and Professor Nam Hollandry are going to take us through their edited volume on media literacy and media education research methods. What a massive undertaking and what an amazing volume. I'm sure we're going to hear lots of it. Let me quickly introduce our speakers for today, uh, the editors of the book. Um, Professor Pierre Fastre is with the University uh, Catholic de Louvain. Uh, he's also Senior Research Associate at the Belgian National Fund for Scientific Research. Um, Professor Nam Holandri is at uh, Telluk University and he's a Canada Research Chair in Media Education and Human Rights. I'm going to be sharing a couple of links in the chat which give you more information about uh, the edited volume. Um, also, the link to the Routledge site, which has more details about the table of contents, as well as a special code, a special discount code, so that you can order the book. And with that, over to the editors. Thank you, Davina. So just let me quickly share my screen so you can all, I'm assuming, see my slides. Can you all see them? Okay, perfect. Um, so I want to start by um, thanking all of you to attend this this webinar, um, and I can see about 25, 26 people in the room, including an AI assistant, so I guess that means that we are truly in 2023. Um, I want to also start by thanking uh, Renee Hobbs, Yonti Friesem, Davina Savate, and Jocelyn Young for accepting to um, program this first webinar on our book and actually for proposing to host four different webinars uh, on, on this book. So three others will follow if you are uh, interested and that might be, uh, well, we will talk about the dates later in the in the talk, of course. I'm not sure whether this should be, okay, I'm gonna move this out of the way. Um, and also um, to thank Pete Bennett and Junul, Julian McDougall, who are the co-editors for the Routledge Research in Media Literacy and Education series in which this book uh, is going to be published uh, early next month and it's going to be uh, available for pre-order, I think in a week. Uh, at least last, last time we checked, that's the dates for that we had. Um, so Norma and I want to take you through um, a number of points before we actually start discussing um, this topic that we believe is really uh, important for media literacy and media education research, which is um, the topic of research methods. Um, so Norma will start by giving a few words on why on earth a book on research methods is interesting. Uh, I will follow up with uh, the issue of getting authors to, dis to discuss their methods, which is not uh, obvious for well, a lot of for a lot of authors. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about the structure of the book and then Normand will close this, uh, this uh, presentation on a few words on methodology as a way of addressing the limits of our research field. So uh, Normand, for the first part, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pierre. Um, I must say that I'm a little bit shocked to see how many people in a room for discussing methodology. So I'm, I'm really pleased to have you here. Um, I have a little bit of a story to tell. Um, perhaps this story will help us to understand why a book on methodology is such of high relevance in our view at, at this precise state and in, in age. Um, more than five years ago, Pierre and I received in our mailbox we did a call to submit a proposal to the Routledge Research and Media Literacy and Education Series, which, as you know, is directed by Pete Bennett and Julian McDougall. And the call went really out to state the, the following. It's, it's reading on, on the slide. This series is dedicated to a more expensive explorations of the known territory of media literacy and education, while also seeking uh, out other cartographies. And as such, it encompasses a diverse international range of contexts that share a conceptual framework at the intersection of cultural studies, critical theories, new social literacies, and critical pedagogy. This series is especially interested in how media literacies and education relates to feminism, critical race theories, social class, postcolonial and inter intersectional approaches, and how these perspective, political objective, and international context can decenter the field of media literacy education. Now, this was all good and all. Um, it really situated media literacy and media education at the convergence of various fields and theories, while at the same time firmly anchoring it into an approach that is focused on power and emancipations. 
it reflected in our view a strong consensus within the academic community about the uses and relevance of media literacy and media educations at our given time. But sometimes, uh, but something was also missing. Uh, and Pierre and I saw an opportunity to discuss something that most researchers try to avoid getting into in Lent if they can, which is methodology. And, and we, we felt this for three specific reasons. Um, first, we really felt that the questions of method and epistemology was a weak side of media literacy and media education research. Too often, while reading work produced within the field, methodology was really lightly discussed, unclear, or produced in a non-reflective manner. There was really a need to start a discussion about our methods, about choices, about difficulties and challenges in a way that would move the field forward. And, and then second, we believe that methodology could, could constitute a wonderful entry point to the field. Through methods, we can discuss theory, policy, media practices, teaching practices, skills, competencies, and evaluations. So it is really a powerful door that opens up fresh way to address the core objects of media literacy and, and media educations. And then thirdly, we, we felt that methodology could be very a powerful way to counter what we, we saw as a raising segmentations of the field. Some scholars work on children's media practices, other on skills, competencies, or abilities, or on teaching practices and pedagogy, or even on policy and curriculum. Some focuses on the individuals, other on small groups, or again, on large number of people. So methodology appeared to us as a way to introduce future readers to a variety of work that it, con that it conducted in our field, and also to broaden perspective about the field's contributions to, to knowledge. But there's also two more reasons actually, actually to enter the field of media education and media literacy from a pedagogical point of view. Um, but these two reasons are only between us, okay? Um, first, um, from the outside, our field can look a little bit like a mess, right? Um, this field draws from information and communication science, from education science, from sociology and political science, from cognitive science and psychology, semiotics and semiology, cultural and media studies. It uses concepts that are controversial and polysemic. It is profoundly normative and is always, always oriented by social, cultural, economic or political objectives even though these are not often that well stated, and even though they are not openly associated with specific teachings and pedagogical activities. So this field articulates really a complicated dialogue between theory and various social media and teaching practices between theoretical, experiential, and empirical knowledge. And, and when we talk about methods, um, we are really looking at the multiplicities of approach, ranging from quantitative surveys to ethnographic observations, and also including experimentations or corpus analysis. All of the families of methods of humanities and social science are indeed mobilized in media education and media literacy research. So therefore, we really felt that there was a need of ordering things, of providing structures and guidance to really to better understand the link between methods, research questions, and research objectives. And then finally, and this was, this was crucial to us, we, we wanted to actually empower readers to understand research methods that are not their own and that they might have very little knowledge about. We wanted them to grasp how these methods are actually used to advance knowledge in the field and how the craft of research is actually done. And, and as such, we worked really hard to ensure that these books can be read as a global introduction or a guide for advanced readers to discover new ways to explore media education and media literacy. Um, we therefore instructed the books authors to move away from presenting a specific research or a specific research and, and really to try to focus on methodology and move away from a defensive stance in order uh, to explore the gains, the limit, the difficulties associated with our methods. And, and Pierre will discuss this further with you. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, as Norma just mentioned, um, 
this is really a challenge, um, uh, writing about our own methods as researchers, and it's, it's not an, an obvious thing to do. Um, and we we experience we experienced this firsthand, uh, really in the process of, of putting together the book. Uh, questioning researchers about their methods uh, is a complicated exercise. It, it may generate discomfort, anxiety, and even, as Norman just mentioned, a bit of uh, defensiveness. Uh, and the reason for this, we felt, is that most of the time we want to present our methods, uh, most of the time in our presentations or in our publications, uh, as a way to uh, assert the validity of the results that we are presenting through uh, the, the, the publications. So we want to present methods, but we seldom want to discuss them. Uh, and the reason we, we felt this was true was that uh, putting re research methods into discussion is actually uh, inviting criticism. And of course, criticism, peer criticism is part of uh, the scientific process, but still uh, we feel that a lot, of, a lot of authors, including us, do not necessarily want to invite criticism uh, and to open Pandora's box and to, to feel vulnerable in explaining our, our methods. Um, another factor that, that, is, that comes into play in the challenge of writing about methods is that most of the methods that we're looking at in media literacy and media education research are tailor-made stuff. Uh, there is no one-size-fits-all method or one universal recipe or procedure uh, to address a specific question or uh, to, to answer a specific research question. So the, the, the way we wanted to get at discussing methods was uh, to get authors to discuss them in close relationship to the actual research questions that they seek to that they sought to to answer. So, one of the guiding questions we could say to, for the book was, "What kind of methods make sense to answer what kind of research questions?" Now, how did we go about um, uh, instructing the authors to to actually write about their methods? Well, uh, let me show you. Uh, an excerpt from the uh, instructions that we sent to the authors um, early in the process. Um, the document actually started with these words, a focus on research methods, and the, the, the literal first sentence of the document was, we cannot insist enough on the fact that this book focuses on research methods. We wrote this because we thought this wasn't an obvious choice for most people to write about media literacy and media education research. So we went on to say, your contribution should focus mainly on methods, they must be detailed, justified, and linked to specific research questions. In other words, you need to demonstrate how a particular method achieves specific results and this answers clear research questions. So we had this requirement of putting methods into discussion in connection with uh, research questions and in connection with clear definitions of the concepts that the, these research uh, questions involve. Another constraint that we uh, imposed onto our authors, so to speak, was that, as uh, Normal said, we wanted readers to be able to grasp these methods and to appropriate them and to adapt them and to learn about them uh, and to feel empowered by the reading of the book. So uh, one of the things we stated was the last bullet on this, uh, on this slide, your main goal in writing this chapter is to allow a reader working on similar research objects or questions to learn and adapt the methods you have used in your work. Uh, another side of the problem was to avoid having contributors just write about their current research projects. We did not want to have presentations of research projects. We, want to have, we wanted to have a deep discussion and a reflective discussion about the methods involved in the project. So it was clear that we needed to have the, like the background of the projects and the questions uh, to actually highlight the relevance and the limits and the challenges of the methods. But we wanted to go behind, beyond the mere presentation of research projects. So we went on further in our instructions to tell uh, contributors how to relate their chapter's contents to their specific research projects. And one of the things we highlighted and, and emphasized was that they could not just uh, present their specific research projects. They had to go one step up uh, you know, to one higher degree of abstraction to use these specific research projects to highlight the added value, the limits, the stakes, and the challenges of using the types of methods detailed in the chapter. Um, we, to some extent, well, to a greatest extent, I think we succeeded in, in uh, actually um, bringing the authors to a point where they actually discussed reflectively the methods that they use. Uh, and then the additional challenge for us was, as Normand uh, already stated it, to, um, to, to create some kind of 
coherent map or a coherent landscape uh, to kind of give the big, big picture of the, the research field of media literacy and media education through the description of, this, uh, of their methods. We did not want to have just a, a collection of different methods that may have uh, given uh, a picture of a fragmented landscape in terms of the, the research landscape of, on media literacy and media education. So um, how did we go about very concretely grouping the different contributions into sections, into three parts, so that we could actually show the coherence of the research field and look for a structure in what can uh, otherwise be seen as a fragmented research field. And the, the, the way we did this was by grouping the, the contributions in three parts, one on studying media practices, one on, on educational initiatives, and one on studying prescriptive discourses. Um, and this is actually something that came along the way. So what we, when we were looking for common threads between the contributions that we, uh, that we gathered, um, initially, our plan was uh, the following. What we said we would do to Pete and to Julian and to Routledge was that we were going to produce a book with four sections, one on theoretical research, one on the analysis of public policies, one on uh, media education practices, and one on the assessment of media literacy, well, the analysis and the assessment of media literacy. And as we went along, we felt like this grouping of this potential grouping of chapters didn't quite uh, work out so well. So uh, we, we ended up with these three parts where, um, well, for example, section four, analyzing and assessing media literacy, uh, the focus on the assessment kind of receded a little bit and we broadened the scope to include the study of media practices and media literacy practices in the first part of the book, media practices. Um, the, well, section three evolved pretty naturally into part two uh, on educational initiatives. And then uh, section two on public policies uh, also had to be broadened so that we could um, highlight the connections between the analysis of public policies and the, the analysis of other types of public discourses, which we called prescriptive discourses. And some of these discourses are actually uh, theoretical models. Uh, for example, reference frameworks, so competence reference frameworks would be one type of pres pres prescriptive discourse that would that is included in part three of the book. Now, I want to say a few words about each uh, part uh, of the book, uh, highlighting both what they're about, uh, I will go very quickly over the, the actual chapters that are included in each part, and then what are some kind of uh, the, the common methodological challenges that these different chapters uh, highlight and discuss. So part one, uh, media practices. Uh, all chapters in this section or in this part are describing and analyzing media practices of different social groups uh, and attempting to define uh, the literacies that they involve and their constituent elements. Uh, we have examples of chapters. We have chapters that uh, study uh, activities in all spheres of uh, human activity in society, uh, all of, <clears throat> of which involve the habitual use of media by individuals and communities. And the kind of common element uh, that defines what these media practices are is that they are defined at the intersection between the media they involve, of course, the physical and the online spaces that the, these practices uh, deploy uh, into or are deployed into uh, at home, at school, at the workplace, in third spaces, for example. Uh, but also, in addition to the media and the spaces, the what we call the actors' teleologies, that is, their intentions, their goals, what they pursue, what, the, what they seek uh, through uh, the development of these practices. And in these practices, media um, play different roles. Uh, they act as technical equipment, as symbolic systems that generate meanings, as a place for social interaction, as an object of specific competencies, as cognitive and affective investment. Uh, the question being, how do these different roles of media fit together and how do these actually create a coherent whole that we can call a media practice? Um, now, I want to just give you a very quick look at the titles of the chapters, and I won't go very systematically through all of them, but just to, to, to show you that these cover uh, topics such as going from the description of media practices to uh, media literacy, the definition of media literacy competence, uh, working with young children and, their, and observing their uh, digital practices at home, uh, participatory action research done with youth from marginalized uh, communities, um, and then the observation of uh, media literacy practices from the perspective of third space um, as a concept or from the perspective of critical inquiry and post-human inquiry. And you can see that in these different chapters, 
Sometimes the entry is uh, theoretical, uh, like the, the chapter four and five. Sometimes the, the entry is pretty much, is very much uh, practical, you know, studying young children. It's a specific population in a specific context at home. Uh, but all these connect through um, a number of common um, methodological, methodological challenges. Um, the first one, and probably the most important one, which I think is shared by all chap chapters in this part, uh, are how to account for the lived experience of the actors that the researcher studies. Uh, and that question kind of translates into the, the issue of how to consider participants, research participants, as active, competent, and reflexive agents, how to integrate their interest and perspective into, into research, and uh, to some extent, in some cases, how to consider them as researchers, as partners of the research being made. Uh, another stake or another issue that comes along with the, the account, with accounting for the lived experience of the, the actors studied is considering the different ethical and epistemological implications of studying media practices. Uh, yet another one uh, has to do with the multifaceted nature of media practices that have a behavioral, a cognitive, a symbolic, and effective, etc., a dimension. Uh, the difficulty being how to document these different dimensions and how to understand what integrates them into a coherent whole. Um, making the transition from media practices to media competencies is also a methodological challenge that is discussed in several uh, chapters. Um, and then also the question of the relationship between media practices and learning. Uh, of course, media practices and media literacy practices uh, are places for meaning making. There are also uh, places or venues for learning, learning about the media or learning about whatever is mediated by the media. Um, and the question of the place of learning within media practices uh, is an opportunity to connect the study of media literacy practices with the study of media education practices. Uh, managing the tension between situated observations that are made locally in very specific contexts and cross-context comparisons is also an issue that is found in several chapters. Uh, and then finally, um, integrating notions of social, social hierarchies, power relations, and culture into the conceptualization of media practices is also a common thread through uh, several of these chapters. Uh, so that's for part one on media practices. Um, part two, two is on educational initiatives, and the chapters in this part either take in the educational initiatives in media education as an object of study, and they study, analyze, and document the effects of media education ac activities most of the time on their beneficiaries. But some chapters also study and contribute to the development of innovative educational practices. And in both cases, it's really a question of articulating the three components of educational initiatives between the didactic and pedagogical processes that they use, the learning outcomes that they pursue, and also these further societal goals that media education is meant to contribute to, such as active citizenship, critical thinking, or lifelong learning. Uh, we have chapters uh, that focus on different types of contexts, uh, media education at school, within communities, or in the family context, uh, in a range of spatial, temporal, and institutional scales, and maybe most importantly, with different types of epistemological stances or positions uh, taken by the researchers, either, uh, well, at one end of the continuum, I would say, from the adoption of uh, an external observer's point of view, which considers media education activities as the, an object to be observed, uh, to uh, the active participation in the development process of educational initiatives. So we have um, a chapter focusing on teachers' views and practices of media literacy, uh, one uh, on the way to articulate students' perspectives with teachers' perspectives, with researchers' perspectives on teaching practices that, are, um, that, that pursue the development of digital skills. We have a chapter on design-based research, uh, which acts as a vessel both for the creation of teaching activities and the refinement of uh, a, a theoretical competency model. We have a chapter on quantitative methods for assessing media literacy in the specific context of health promotion. And then finally, a more reflexive chapter by Rene Hobbes on the way different types of measures of media literacy can or cannot align with the goals and the pedagogies of the projects that they seek to assess. Uh, again, a few common methodological, methodological challenges um, that we found throughout these chapters. Uh, the first one being how to define and how to measure 
what one would call the success of media education, uh, of a media education initiative. What can we call a success in terms of media education? Um, articulating the perspectives of the different actors involved, teachers, learners, and researchers in the, uh, the analysis of, uh, and the development in some cases of educational initiatives. Uh, managing the tension between the need for uh, measures that are aligned with the educational initiative's goals and pedagogies and that are kind of tailor-made uh, to, uh, uh, to, to fit these educational initiative's goals and pedagogies, and the need for replication and meta-analyses, which call for uh, more standardized methods and more standardized procedures. And finally, how to account for the transition within media, uh, media education initiatives uh, from educational intentions to pedagogical practices and from pedagogical practices to learning outcomes. Um, so this is for part two. And then finally, uh, the last part of the book uh, focuses on prescri prescriptive discourses. And what we mean by prescriptive discourses is all types of public discourse that circulate in the public sphere and that relate to media education and media literacy. Uh, our first approach to, to uh, this topic was to focus on uh, public policies. Public policies in media education are, of course, an important category in prescriptive discourses, but we also wanted to include other types of discourses produced by academia or by the nonprofit sector or by the media industry itself that have an impact on the way media literacy and media education is thought of in society and the way it's implemented and practiced. Uh, and what all of these discourses have in common is uh, some kind of performative dimension. Their very existence um, has this performative uh, dimension, of course, at varying degrees of strength that go from uh, influencing or inflecting social representations of what media literacy or media education is or should be to engaging uh, actors to translate these discourses into reality when they are produced by official bodies. For example, a media literacy curriculum uh, is actually a prescription for you know teachers to uh, perform a certain number of uh, education activities as part of their profession. So Again, a very brief outlook on the five chapters uh, included in this part of the book. Uh, we have one chapter on um, international uh, uh, comparison of institutional discourses taking a social anthropological approach um, to public discourse on and to public policies on media education. Uh, one chapter focused on a content analysis method for analyzing school curricula and the place that media education has in school curricula. Uh, quick scan analysis is a method presented by uh, our uh, colleagues, Leo Van Udenov and, and colleagues, uh, to analyze, categorize, and compare different types of media literacy and digital literacy reference frameworks. Uh, we have a chapter on critical discourse studies and how they highlight the political and ideological dimensions of discourses on media and information literacy. And then finally, a chapter on deliber deliberative approaches that allow to involve stakeholders into drafting and producing media education policy. Um, Again, a few common threads, uh, common methodolog methodological challenges uh, between these five chapters. Uh, the first question may sound like an obvious question, but how, how do you bound the discourse you're going to study? How do you build and how do you analyze a certain corpus of discourses and how do you bound it? Um, how do you go about comparing discourses and frameworks and how do you, about, do you go about doing this by uh, both comparing and contextualizing each discourse within their own specific contexts. Um, how can one account for the connections between representations of media, representations of targeted competencies, representations of teaching processes and school subjects within these prescriptive discourses? Um, how does one go about documenting the political and ide ideological dimensions of institutional discourses on media literacy? And finally, how does one go about involving stakeholders in policy development and deliberative and participatory approaches? So you can see that these are very general questions that are kind of woven into the different chapters that compose the book. Um, we hope, we believe that by grouping the chapters into these three parts and highlighting these uh, common methodological challenges, we've, kind, we've actually um, succeeded to some extent into uh, ordering a little bit the research field of media literacy and media education research. Um, and now for the last part of the presentation, I will hand 
the microphone back to normal. Thank you, Pierre. Um, I, I would I would really like just to briefly conclude our presentations by by sharing with you two critics that can be articulated on the state of media education and media literacy research, um, and uh, and how we believe our book actually answers to to these limits. And first, uh, and this is quite well known now. The, the conceptual landscape of media education and media literacy research is really quite a messy place. And there are now dozens of concepts of literacies, each to be defined in multiple ways, each often assumed to be non-problematic or at least considered wrongly to be defined in a consensual manner. Uh, in our work published in 2022, Jadzil Wonkin, Pierre and I, we actually found three things. Um, First, that there really is a lack of shared definition of so-called literacies. We are still in dispute about the scope and meaning conferred to our key concepts, media literacy, digital literacy, and information literacy. Palska and, and Romaco even notes the existence of, of what they call a, fa a false consensus about the meaning of media literacy, um, as it is often assumed to be understood in a convergent way by various scholars. And this is, of course, not the case. Um, and second, the anchoring of research in, in one or many disciplines is really quite often problematic. Others within the field really make explicit their disciplinary postures, and many published papers simply make no mention or of failing under a particular discipline. Then it becomes quite difficult to actually situate research work and to proceed to appropriate evaluations of their contributions to, to knowledge. And then the, the work that concentrate on the operationalizations of concept of literacies into practice in an educational framework really remains few and scarce. Um, rather, many reviews highlight the significant difficulties in operationalizing the key concepts of literacies brought to the fore by the literature. So conceptual tools are frequently developed in an abstract manner, and they are disconnected from the reali realities, difficulties, and perspectives of actors responsible for developing assets of literacy-related abilities. And Pierre, if you just want to move the slide. Um, and then this brings us to our second friendly critique of the literature and how our book answers to the shortcomings we see in the field. As a key concept um, for us within the field of media education and media literacy is really the one of articulation. When we look at the core object, that really is two things that we are looking at. The first is the relationships that, pe that people maintain with what we call the media, the place and role that media have in people's lives. And, and this is complicated stuff. It could be looked at from the point of view of what the media does to us or what we do with the media or both. And these relationships can be looked at an individual, at a group or at a macro level. So there is a core assumption here. Underlying our field, this relationships between us and the media is, at least in some aspects, problematic and requires interventions of some sorts, right? So the second thing we are looking at in our field is how we can improve these relationships through teachings, educational and pedagogical activities. And this means increasing technical skills, self-awareness, information literacy, our capacity to express ourselves, to make good use of technology, and so on. So there is a second assumption here. Media education can increase media literacy, and through media literacy, we can achieve several objectives that we perceive to be proper responses to media problems and media need. So when we talk about articulations, we are raising a crucial questions. What knowledge should be transmitted? through what pedagogical and teaching processes, to develop what skills in order to achieve what objectives and for whom? Is it not a key question of our field? So consequently, there are four elements that we need, four elements that are involved. First, there are theoretical knowledge, which as you know, encompass an epistemological stage, conceptual apparatus and a set of propositions on the media, their role, their functioning, their functions and impact. And then we focus on pedagogical practices through which this knowledge is transmitted and assimilated. Then skills that we seek to develop in relations to the media. And finally, pre-identified social, economic, political, or cultural objectives, sometimes codified by policy and curriculum. 
Each of these elements constitute an entry point to our field, both for academics and for practitioners. And we felt that the literature often does not articulate these elements one to another properly. So our book had the explicit objective of requesting that each chapter be situated within the disciplines of its author. Each chapter has to be transparent about the concept it used and how they are used. It had to articulate closely the links between research questions, conceptual and theoretical tools, methods, and finding. And by doing so, we were engaged in a process of re-articulating the key element of research in our field and make much more explicit the positions of each chapters with regard to theory, peda pedagogical practices, skills, and objectives. And I will leave it to Pierre for the final word. Okay, well, uh, the only final words I can add is thank you for your attention. And we, we would uh, be delighted to um, further the discussion with you. I just want to mention, uh, and I may um, put a, share this screen maybe before we close the session in, in about 20 minutes uh, so that you can actually take notes of the next dates uh, for the, the, the other webinars for this, uh, for this book. So we have three uh, dates scheduled. Each will uh, feature one specific chapter of the book and will present a more in-depth discussion of the themes and topics uh, presented in the chapter. Uh, and so all of these will happen uh, between January 15th and March 4th, 2024. So stay, stay tuned for more about uh, this book. Again, thank you for your attention. Um, Davina, I don't know how you plan to uh, manage the discussion. We can manage it. You can manage it. We have questions. I, I saw that we have at least a couple of our contributors in attendance. I saw that the names of uh, Donna, I can actually see Donna on my screen right now. And I have seen um, Stéphane, Stéphane Chaudron. Uh, yes, she's still in attendance. Uh, we have questions for them. We have questions for all of you. You may also have questions, but um, I'll leave the discussion open at least at first. Um, I was just wondering if um, if it's okay with the editors to have maybe um, the authors who are here say maybe a one or two lines about about their chapters. Can I, can, can I can I be a little more directive than that? And I don't mean to put yes. them on the spot, but I would we would love actually we discussed this with with no more while preparing this this webinar. We would uh, love to hear. Uh, both of them or all of them, I'm not sure I spotted all of our contributors here, um, uh, about the, the relevance of the exercise of writing about research methods, both for them and what they feel might be the relevance of writing about methods for the field of media literacy and, and digital literacy. And I'm not going to point fingers, so, so whoever wants to start. I, I... <laughs> Stefan speaking. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, I, I was just uh, about to write um, how wonderful that uh, um, that journey of writing this the chapter this chapter was um, because we wrote the chapter something like two or three years after actually um, the the start and the core of our um, research. So it was really a journey in 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 our memory and and um, and also uh, it was really important. We realized how important it was to write about what we did because um, we had all our documentation, of course, and we kept that. But um, making the effort to render that methodology um, accessible and, and under, understandable to others make things clearer in our mind too. And made also uh, really clear or reappeared um, essential questions like ethical questions about our methodologies or and, and reactivated actually the dialogues and, um, and the um, uh, the discussions we had at the time of our um, study with um, the space and, 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 and the length of time that really worked for us to have more distance about um, 
about our work and the solution we find at that time and how relevant we find it still or maybe not um, with uh, with some more yeah some more experience behind us um, and some other you know knowledge so that was really really great for us and we hope um, reading this chapter about our um, uh, way to investigate the use of digital technology by young children uh, would be um, inspiring for other researchers. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Donna, would you want to say a word? Your, your mic is muted, Donna. Yeah, there are two Donnas here. I'm not sure which <laughs> one you were directing it, but uh, I'll jump in quickly and uh, say that uh, speaking on behalf of my two co-authors, uh, William Wright and Ellen Wynn, both of whom were involved in their dissertation work, that was William and uh, Ellen in her master's MA thesis. And I cannot, um, I guess I can never thank both Pierre and Norman enough for having presented us and me as their advisor uh, on some of their work, not, not as their major advisor, but in classes that I was teaching. I want to really thank Pierre and Norman for making this a collegial um, review process. I never think that I have ever worked as hard on a chapter. <laughs> <laughs> or as long and but it was so well done in the sense of fair exchanges hard questions were asked on either end and respect was shown I thought uh in ways that are not always evident when one is working uh with um an editorial team and so I just would say if if William and Ellen are here, I am speaking for you, but please speak up. I looked over and can't see you, but you might be here. Thank you, Pierre and Norman. Thank you, Dana. Um, I just quickly wanted yeah. to ask the editors if y'all had questions for the attendees, or if you would invite questions from the attendees. Usually we do invite some questions. I'm sorry, usually you do questions? what? Usually we do invite questions from attendees to the speakers. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. But you, but please. you did mention earlier on that you had some um, thought questions or some idea uh, well, questions. Well, I, I, I would think that these are less important than whatever questions that the the attendees have for us. So this is the time in case you haven't put your question down because I I don't see any questions as yet in the chat. Uh, you could unmute yourself or even come on video and ask your question. And while you're gathering your thoughts, I suppose I can sneak in a question. Facilitator privileges. Um, how how important is reflexivity when, when you're working on projects like these, where you're trying to understand uh, methods, uh, you know, in the past and then also the kind of impact it has on the future? as both authors and editors. Um, okay, um, well, I think that by, by nature, this is a, a very reflexive exercise to write about methods. And th this is something that we really try to encourage in, in our authors and in ourselves, because uh, Norma and I each uh, co-authored uh, a, a chapter. Um, the, the, I think the, the exercise would be meaningless if it if if it wasn't reflexive, um, in the sense that what we want to get at is uh, essentially this this articulation between research questions and methods that I that I described earlier, and you can't do that if you if you are not ready to take a hard look at the research that you're doing, um, and be critical of, uh, about of it or about it. Um, it's just, yeah, there, nothing can come out of um, a simple factual description of what was done and the instruments that were involved and the analysis procedures that were uh, put together. Uh, if you're not going to try to point to both the, the relevance, but also the challenges and the weaknesses 
of the 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 the, the methods involved. So yeah, it, it is by nature a reflexive um, exercise, which is why I think it's not a natural exercise because, as I said, you're you're basically inviting people to criticize your work in a way uh, where you're doing half of the job, um, and this is not something that is easy to do for most people. Uh, but I think it's important, uh, especially because of all the uh, the pitfalls and the limits of the uh, of the research field that that Normand highlighted. Uh, we need that kind of critical examination, and we need that kind of. We, I think we need that examination to come from the people who actually do the research that is being uh, examined, instead of uh, being examined by by I don't know other people from other disciplines or other research fields. So uh, yeah, Normand. We did something that I believe that very few scholars do. We actually welcome failure, right? Uh, we welcome it. Um, and, and we were actually looking forward about the lessons that came with it and, and difficulties that came with failures and difficulties and setbacks and hardships. Um, so this book, the, the writing of this book was a little bit like a therapy process for, for, for us, actually, as researchers, right? Because it, it actually feels really good to, to be able to speak about the, the hardships that we faced, about the difficulties and setbacks that we that, that we have encountered, and, and how it actually helped us become better researchers afterwards, right? Um, and we had a, a little bit like a mantra, Pierre and I, while um, uh, editing the book, we had to understand everything. Uh, we had to understand each and every chapters. And it actually was, for some chapters, quite a challenge for us because it was really far away from what we're used to be doing. Uh, so we had very little previous knowledge about the kind of methods and even the, the theoretical perspective of some of the others. Uh, but if we manage to understand and if we can engage in a conversations about clarity and openness and transparency with the others, then we made the, the bet that the readers would do the same and that we would have something that, that would perhaps be different from the rest of the book published in the matter. If if I may add just one thing to to what Norman just said, I think that there's there was a natural um, complementarity between uh, the reflexivity of the exercise and the dialogue that we tried to instill with our contributors. Uh, it's I mean it's a very Vygotskian perspective on things, but you know um, cognitive processes are first social uh, processes, and by engaging in a dialogue where we we never held back in in asking hard questions to our authors, but we don't know what you mean by this. How do you do that? How, what are the entailments of this? Uh, this is how I know. Uh, from my perspective as an author, so as a contributor to of, of one chapter, uh, it's by receiving these hard questions from Normand that I questioned myself and that I really became reflexive uh, about the, the methods that I used and that I that I was trying to explain in detail in the in the chapter that I co-wrote. Can I um? Can I just come on and, um, and say, I wonder, thanks for the presentation. It, it's absolutely excellent. Um, the, the stuff that Normand at the end was talking about, the problems with media literacy and media education are partly the, um, the reasons why we need this book, aren't they? I was thinking of Jacques Rancière talking about um, two important things for him transversality crossover points we're full of those but the second one was precision and he said he learned precision from being a gardener and i kind of think that's a lovely idea and it seems to me what attracted us <laughs> was the kind of incredible ambition of this project um because um it's not often something deserves to be called a handbook to me, something that deserves to be called a handbook needs to be properly useful. It needs to be something you can put your hands to. Um, and I just wonder whether um, Normand's um, analysis of the area, the lack of definition, it's not surprising, is it? Um, you know, Freire said, why would, um, why would the ruling class allow us an education which would help us to understand the way in which we're being manipulated. That's doubly true of media education. Um, 
But is that is that your justification? That, that's the justification for this book, isn't it? That in that landscape, in that unweeded garden, the only thing that will have any chance of making starts is supreme precision, challenge, discipline. I thought Stefan and Donna were really um, expressing it, that you've got authors coming around, creating something energetic and fresh. And I've edited a lot of edited collections and often they are people, stuff left over that people bring. And this is entirely the other end of the scale. You know, you set yourself a challenge, I say in the chat. Um, and and, and I, know it's a, I know how successful you've been, but by God, that could have been a glorious failure, couldn't it? Given your, given your uh, demand for each of your collective to address research methods, you know, uh, I just, I don't know whether that's a question, it probably is, it's probably a protestation. <laughs> Last thoughts, editors? No, I just would like to share maybe um, um, a feeling that I've got and received when actually Pierre knocked at my door and said, would you be interested in writing a a chapter and the methodology of your um, of your study, and um, I closed my eyes, <laughs> took a deep breath, and said, and, and then, what on earth will it be looked like? I mean, I was I was not sure at all in which direction this this would go. Although I lived and breathed that study for for nearly five years, a hundred percent, and. Uh, um so indeed um we are not used to uh put in under the light spot our methodologies and i i really think it's it's uh this kind of um, initiatives was really needed to remind us how important those um reflexive time and efforts uh, are actually so again thank you so much to you both for this wonderful thank idea you. and for all the energy you put in to brought it into a wonderful uh, collection of pages i i must say I'm, I'm, really I'm still eager to... uh, after several years of working on this project i'm still surprised by the way in which we are thanked for being a pain in the neck <laughs> um, and for asking people to write, you know, to put, as you said, Stefan, to put in the spotlights the stuff that we usually sweep under the rug. Uh, but I guess it was, yeah, it was worth being a, a pain in the neck with all of you. And it was a pleasure. I mean, you know, that came out wrong, right? <laughs> Um, all right, so we only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, first of all, I have to thank everyone who's here today, all the attendees, um, some of the authors, and of course, our editors and speakers. Uh, yes, thank you so much. We have more from uh, this particular volume uh, at the Media Education Lab. Um, two of these sessions uh, fall under the Inequalities in Media Education webinar series and information about them will be up on the website soon. Uh, but for now, I'm adding a link to the Inequalities in Media Education webinar series in the chat. Uh, please give a look. Our last two sessions, uh, uh, the recordings of the last two sessions are already on. And uh, we also have another um, webinar series called AI in the Classroom. Um, and over here, you will find information about the upcoming one, towards the end of November, uh, as well as recordings of the ones which have already been conducted. Um, and immediately after this, on the 16th of November, as part of the Inequalities in Media Education webinar series, we have uh, a session on immigrant influencers on TikTok 
by Dr. Daniela Haramia Dent. Um, I hope you get to join us for that. Uh, media practices and prescriptive discourses is also part of the same series. Um, and educational interventions is scheduled as part of the media club um, on these dates. With that, I must thank everyone for their time and for this brilliant volume that you have put together and this uh, excellent, excellent presentation, which was really quite uh, the introduction to the volume. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you for being there. Thanks, Lars. Thank you.